This week on Indie News, if you ever wanted to swap out the sensor in your camera, soon you'll be able to with this cinema camera now in development. Next, Pond5 collaborates with Reuters to build the world's largest collection of editorial footage. Finally, a new startup is building an app that will edit your footage for you using artificial intelligence. Hey, Indie Mogulers, Griffin here. I talk a lot about new camera technology. It's exciting. But I also try to remind people that storytelling is way more important to your audience. They will never know and won't even care if you're shooting with the latest camera model. That being said, I understand why filmmakers get obsessed about these things. We wanna shoot with the latest, greatest stuff. So what if instead of buying a new camera every six months to keep up with technology, what if you could just swap out the sensor in your camera? Octopus Cinema is in the early development stages for their new Octopus Camera, a customizable camera which they say will be completely open source. Open source basically means that the parts and software to build the camera are freely available to the public to use, modify, and redistribute. That means you could theoretically find, code, and build all of the parts to assemble the Octopus Camera yourself. The current prototype model is powered by Linux and runs on an 8-core i7 CPU with 16 gigs of RAM. So this is a computer. That's handy because Octopus Cinema hopes to install programs like Unity 3D augmented reality into the camera to bring real-time VFX, live camera tracked effects you can see while shooting. The camera itself will be able to record in formats like 10-bit HEVC, in 12-bit Cinema DNG, but the biggest selling point is the fact that you can replace the camera sensor. So the same way that I currently swap out lenses, apparently I will be able to do that with the sensor itself. In this prototype model, Octopus Camera uses sensors from Shimea, who is making a 5K full frame and 4K 4 thirds inch sensor. While each sensor offers a different set of frame rates, both sensors feature global shutter and at least 12 stops of dynamic range. You can also choose between a color or native monochrome sensor. It's clear that the purpose of a camera like this is to make filmmaking technology, cinema technology, even more affordable and bring it to the masses. When asked about the inspiration behind the Octopus camera, lead engineer and founder Russell Newman said, My background is in 3D graphics and software engineering, and I always had a strong interest in cinema technology. I had until recently owned almost every camera Blackmagic design released. Blackmagic's success and projects such as the digital Bolex made me realize that the days of pro quality footage being reserved for the likes of a 10,000 pound plus Sony camera would soon be gone. By Pounds, he means British pounds. I'm realizing I should have read that whole quote with a British accent. With the rise of mirrorless cameras offering high bitrate recording, we've all seen the price and size of cameras come down in recent years. So it's cool to see a product in the cinema camera tier attempting to do the same. You'll have to wait a little while on pricing information and at least a year, next year, summer 2020, is when this camera is supposed to come out. Last week, I mentioned that I have relied on stock video for some client projects. I had a client that needed an aerial shot of a train in Tokyo, which is not particularly hard to find. What's harder though is in my political news reporting work. I do a lot of documentary filmmaking about presidential candidates. And for a project like that, I can't just pick any stock video. I really need very specific stock video about that candidate. So our next story is pretty useful to me. The idea of Pond5, one of the most recognizable sources of stock footage, partnering with Reuters, one of the most recognizable names in international news coverage. They're joining to create a massive library of royalty-free editorial footage. You can now search their library of over 4.3 million video clips, everything from archival footage to sports to current events. With new editorial clips being added every single day, Pond5 and Reuters have amassed what they say is the world's biggest editorial stock footage library. It's worth noting that they have other partners on this library. Cover contributes a lot of entertainment clips from red carpet appearances to celebrity interviews. And you can find plenty of user-generated clips on Newsflare. And they're going to bring more editorial partners on in the future. Historically, news clips like the ones that Reuters is bringing to Pond5 have been pretty expensive. In fact, I have personal experience with this. When I was working on the film Sriracha, I came across archival footage of the boat that my main character, David Tran, left Vietnam on. And it was an archival clip on Reuters from 1979. I paid $1,500 
for my first license, but then I actually had to expand the license to a $2,500 license to be able to do everything I wanted to do. So I looked it up and this very clip that I used in my film that I paid $2,500 to use, it's available on Pond5 for like just over $200 for a digital license and I think $1,500 for the expanded license. Now, one thing to know about these licenses for the editorial footage is they only want you to use them in an editorial way, in a newsy documentary way. You can't use the shot of David Tran's boat to promote your alcohol company. But already we're seeing the prices of these clips coming down just by partnering with Pond5, so that's great. Pond5 says that their footage starts as low as $79 a clip. Now, if you've never bought stock video footage before, you may be thinking, why would I ever spend $79 for one shot? But sometimes it's the shot you need, especially if it makes your film that much better, then it's probably worth it. We're seeing a lot of machine learning being put to use in creative software to make it more powerful. I think about content-aware fill in After Effects. Select something, delete it, and After Effects is smart enough to put in a new backplate for you. So this speeds things up for us. It makes our jobs as editors easier, but I'm wondering at what point does the AI do so much that we're out of a job? I do like to think that most of what I do as an editor is art, but a lot of editing decisions are pretty predictable. Take out the shaky footage, put this part that's in focus in. I mean, that, that stuff's pretty predictable and maybe AI could do the job. A new startup company called Trash, <laughs> it's just a, it's a funny name. <laughs> a new startup called Trash promises to make video editing more accessible for the average person. It was founded by CEO Hannah Donovan, who was previously the general manager for Vine before Twitter acquired and eventually shut down the company. With Trash, Donovan hopes to lower the barrier of entry to professional video editing. The way you interface with this app is supposedly a three-step process. First, you'll choose the clips you want to edit. Then you pick out music based on a couple of descriptors. Finally, you designate a vibe that you're going for, from chill to meh to mind blown. After that, it's just a matter of moving some clips around and adjusting the speed of the music, and then you're done. So what's really going on in the background? For starters, the app uses a neural network, meaning it's learned from tons of other footage, and analyzes your footage to identify elements like people, faces, and dynamic actions to see which parts of the video to keep. Next, it takes those video fragments and edits them to the music, creating a mini music video shareable to social media. Through this process, the app will continue to gather more training data from the footage that users throw at it. That's how a neural network works. Chief scientist Genevieve Patterson says that the current training data that they've given the neural network is, quote, Hollywood-style cinematography. But you can imagine that these decisions it makes will get smarter as more users are brought on board. Since its inception, the company has raised $2.5 million to develop the app. The funding is from sources such as the National Science Foundation. Currently, it isn't focused on generating revenue yet because the company is still onboarding creators in a closed beta. Users can request an invitation, but it's only available on iOS for now. There's no official launch date for the app yet, but if you check out the company's Instagram, the video edits already look pretty pretty promising. Now, I don't feel scared yet about this AI taking over my editing job. I mean, for example, the videos are all music-based. You can imagine, for a lot of the stuff I do, interview-based footage, how difficult that could be for AI to figure out and to do J cuts and L cuts. So there are still artful things I can do, but hey, if AI wants to make my job a little bit easier, I'm interested. Here is a new segment for Indie News. I wanna answer some of your questions from the YouTube comments on previous episodes. This question comes from Nate and Noah Try Life. Griffin, what are your thoughts on 6K as a necessity for filmmakers? I feel like I just upgraded to 4K. Do you see it as necessary for us to jump over to 6K soon? No. I don't think it's a, quote, necessity to have 6K, definitely not. 4K and 1080 to most audiences barely look different even on a movie theater screen. 6K is all about giving yourself more resolution to work with as a filmmaker if you need to do things like punch in. So if you wanna master everything in 4K, you could shoot in 6K and have a little bit of extra room to work with. Also great for visual effects. The next question from Orage Media is, why do I say, hey, indie mogulers, and not just call you all indie moguls? 
I had no idea what the answer to this question was. I'm sure I say, hey, indie mogulers, because Justin and Eric did before me on the channel. So I asked Justin Johnson, one of the founders of Indie Mogul, and he said he doesn't remember exactly why they decided so many years ago to say it that way. But moguls is that thing in skiing, the bumps, and mogulers is a whole new word, so that's pretty cool. I like that it's a unique word that's special to our channel. Thanks for watching this week's episode of Indie News. And as always, let us know in the comments what you thought about these stories. If you have questions that you'd like us to answer in a future episode, or if you just have suggestions for stories that you want to share with this audience. And of course, be sure to like and subscribe to Indie Mogul for more educational and entertaining filmmaking content like this. I will see you next week. Thank you so much.